Hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's Feliciano Live. We're here with Dr. Denise Applebaum. She's an assistant professor here at the Feliciano School of Business in the Department of Accounting and Finance. We are talking about auditing black box AI today. That's our topic. As we go through our questions, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them, and we'll get to as many as we can. So welcome, Dr. Applebaum. Thank you. Uh, first question is, what is black box AI? Okay, thank you very much, Phil, for inviting me to share my research and my uh, research concerns on this format. Um, yes, I'm an assistant professor of accounting and finance. And you may be asking why an accounting and finance professor would be interested in a technology topic such as artificial intelligence. Well, basically, businesses are undertaking use of AI in more and more applications, as Dr. Shane discussed last week on this format. And as such, they're beginning to disclose in their annual reports, um, as of 2018, 50 companies are disclosing their concerns about the risk of AI to their business. Uh, it would be litigation risk, financial risk, reputation risk, regulatory risk, and also ethical risk. And as auditors, we need to examine then these financial statements and the companies for the risk that the artificial intelligence will pose to that firm. So hence my research in this topic. Um, black box algorithms are basically those types of artificial intelligence applications where we know the data that goes in, so we have an idea of the data sets we're using, although they may be massive in size, usually they are, and we know the output, but we don't really know all that goes on inside. That's why it's called a black box, because it's not a transparent situation. We know theoretically the application's uh, design and what it's supposed to be doing, but we Given a certain data set we put in, how did the data, how was it mishmashed, how was it uh, weighted in different iterations of these algorithm cycle to come up with this conclusion? And you'd be surprised that businesses are using these kind of applications for their business decision-making pr uh, processes. But uh, AI has been proven to show that it, it can take large data sets where it's a challenge for a human being to process this information or to understand it, and based on the type of design of the system, come up with some really uh, very accurate conclusions. So recently, the New York Times reported on the fact that Google Mind, the deep mind Google application, outbeat scientists in discovering how proteins uncouple. So this is a massive data set. It was a huge challenge for the science in, uh, by biotechnical community. And this AI algorithm beat out the other scientists um, and also uh, beat the, 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 the world champion in Go. So, uh, it's, used, it's very useful for uh, applications where we have set rules and uh, defined uh, understandings of business situations. Uh, where the challenge has been in AI is more of the uh, intuitive type decisions where there's more than just quantitative data that goes into that decision. Uh, so for example, uh, AI is getting a lot of negative publicity recently about facial recognition. Uh, a Stanford University professor uh, was using facial recognition AI to show that uh, the, uh, this particular AI could predict uh, someone's uh, sexual orientation. Or another company was using AI to see whether, uh, based on facial recognition, that they could predict whether someone has terrorist tendencies or not. And this was purchased by governments, and the company would not disclose which governments were using this product. So uh, an auditor walks into a company that's using AI, that's disclosed AI as a risk on this annual report, and now needs to examine this black box algorithm for uh, whether it's using, whether it's the data that's going in this question, whether design is at issue, or the, uh, the results are at issue. Um, so this is what my research is currently about. I'm working with my department chair, Dr. Ronald Strauss, on this very topic. So for those who just joined us, we're here with Dr. Applebaum. She's an assistant professor here at the Feliciano School of Business and Accounting and Finance. We're talking about auditing black box AI. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them as we progress through our questions here. Next question is, what companies are currently using black box? Okay, well, so there's a, quite a number of companies using black box algorithms or AI, which, like I said, is very complicated. Uh, we have a number of banks are using this for loan risk assessment, insurance companies are using AI, uh, biomedical firms are using this to help extract or learn about the behaviors of drugs and patents of drugs and genealogies. Uh, but also, it's also being used by many universities and research institutions, uh, the defense industry is using AI. In fact, one of the largest uh, research uh, think tanks, DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, has been exploring how to make AI explainable for two years and is still, uh, still challenged by this issue because 
when you try to make black box AI explainable, you lose some of the speed and efficiency of the AI, AI application. Our next question, are there several approaches to black box? Well, there are several approaches. Of basically, the black box is, we're talking about the algorithm where we are letting the data that goes in be explored and weighted by the machine as there's more data to figure out uh, new insights. So uh, the company needs to ask itself, is there something about the data that I would like to know that I can extract by other purposes or other means? And so if that's the situation, then the companies would use the AI, which is considered to be more of a black box, uh, because they would really not know how the machine's arriving at its decision. Great. Our next question, does performance increase when using black box? Well, it's not a matter of performance increasing. It's a matter of whether it can actually it, it, it allows us to gather insights or see relationships in the data that we may not have seen otherwise with other applications. So yes, in a sense, the performance does increase, but then again, it requires massive computer power, which is now available to many companies these days, and massive amounts of data. So these are the two restrictions, but this is why businesses are look turning to AI because they have been collecting lots of data. You know, you know every day you create thousands of uh, data sets just walking around with your cell phone. I mean, and someone's collecting all this information about you, the listener. Uh, and so all this data is being crunched by companies and they want to have competitive advantage, a strategic advantage and insights into what this data could tell them beyond what they would normally expect to see with other algorithms. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of black box in summary? Well, the disadvantage is that we don't really know how it arrived at the decision. So some companies are concerned about litigation and reputation and ethical risks, and this is uh, a huge topic in the scientific community right now, how to program or how to get rid of the bias that may be inherent in the data that, may, that might be inherent in the, the programming, or, and how to solve and understand where this occurs in the algorithm. So it's a lack of understanding of how the algorithm is functioning between the time the data goes in and the time, between the time that the data, uh, the results come out. And then also, um, basically it's being used by companies for, like I said, additional insights. Okay, our next question is, what is deep learning? Well, deep learning basically is the process, like I mentioned, where we are expecting the machine to tell us something more and it's supposed to learn on its own basically based on the weightings of massive amounts of data and the decisions that it comes up with as to how, what, what is new about this data? What, is, what are the insights that can be gained from the data? Um, it's not so much rules-based, although it may start off as a, a human-based, rules-based function, but it expands beyond that. Uh, and this is where the, the conundrum comes because we don't really know how that deep learning is occurring uh, in intimate detail within the algorithm. And our final question is, can we trust AI? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think it depends on, if we remember that AI is actually a whole myriad of different types of machine learning functions, so artificial intelligence basically is machine-acquired intelligence. Uh, we have what's called soft AI, which is basically you know, where we have human programmed rules, if-then functions, uh, business logic being programmed into AI. And this is very understandable. So yes, that is trusting because we can actually go in and see how the machine arrived at the decision and how the number, those numbers were crunched or, or the decision that was made. When we get to the deeper learning, which is more the exploratory, where we have many, many, many iterations of uh, statistical weights given to functions and to the data, this is where the problem occurs and we don't know how that decisions are being arrived at. So maybe that is less trusting or at least trustworthy for right now. Uh, but then again, like I said, it's really a way of weighing of the benefits could be had by the AI uh, decision making and AI insights versus the cost or the risk of litigation or reputation risk or financial strategic risk. So it's really a decision that society has to make as a whole. Uh, and I would like to point out that some of the problems or disadvantages of AI are not exclusive to AI. So the problem of data having a bias inherent in it. So you know, lending data is a good example. Many people complain about the lending decisions made uh, by AI instruments in terms of lending and, uh, and neighborhood territories. Well, uh, basically this may be a data problem, not a decision making by the machine because the data may be accurate. Uh, and the question is whether we want to have accuracy versus uh, ethics. And so this is a, these are all topics that need to be debated and decided by the business community and also regulators and also auditors. 
We have a live question. Okay. How might the technology contribute to cultural or racial biases? Well, it, it, could, it could contribute if we're not aware of where the bias lies in the data. And also uh, in the programming, uh, you know, basically many humans are doing a lot of the programming and they may be in silos uh, apart from the business as a whole. So this is, a, this is also a, a corporate uh, environmental or ecosystem problem where we have in the technology department, which has really not really thought too hard about some of these ethical situations or ethical implications of some of the of decisions that are being made by these machines or the applications. So we have to be very careful going forward. In fact, I would say that the artificial intelligence community is going to take, take a step backward to see where the bias is occurring, because it has been shown that there is bias occurring in the results. And we don't want it to amplify the bias that may, may already be in society or may, be, may be already in the data. We have another question. Mm -hmm. How do we hold the AI accountable for its decisions? Well, this is also a good question, um, and it's one that we're trying to debate uh, in the community right now. Uh, you know, that, that it goes to the whole problem of the uh, Uber driver, uh, of the Uber car that ran into some uh, pedestrian in Arizona. Uh, who was legally liable for that? Was it the AI uh, application that's running the car? Was it the car owner? Was it the person in the car? Uh, so, uh, you know, these are legal questions that are being debated right now, and we re we're really looking for better guidance from the government and from the legal community as to who would be responsible for any type of machine learning application. So we thank you, Dr. Oppelhoff. Thank you. Time. We're going to be back on February 21st. We're talking about the future of CSR and business with one of our faculty members from the marketing department. Until then, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much.